So that's it for housekeeping announcements. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Kristalina Georgieva, who needs no introduction as the European Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I am so impressed how many people are attending this fourth gathering. Uh, I was wondering how come we got so many people this time around, whether it is because we haven't been together for so long that we miss each other. Uh, but then I, I decided that I would conclude on the note that the strength of civil protection in Europe is such that of course we would fill a room of this size, no problem. Um, I am uh, very proud to be the commissioner in charge of civil protection. In the three and a half years I have been on the job, I have seen multiple times the courage, the dedication, the camaraderie of our teams when they are in the field, in action, or when they put some sweat in training exercises. We come from diverse backgrounds. In this room, among us, we speak at least 23 languages, maybe more. And yet, when we act, we act as one. Whether it has been in places far away, I started just after the Haiti earthquake, and then was Chile and Pakistan, the triple disasters in Japan, or it is when we act when a disaster overwhelms one of us. And I very vividly remember Poland, Hungary, Romania, my own country, Bulgaria, Cyprus, Time and again, what we see is the difference the EU civil protection mechanism makes in terms of coordinated action. The gains in, in speed, in comprehensiveness of response, in efficiency are very impressive. Over these three and a half years, I have visited many of you. I first thought I'm going to list every country I was able to visit and see the civil protection authorities and teams there. <laughs> but it is a very long list, so I decided I'm going to list those I haven't yet visited. And there are four countries, Slovenia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Malta. And I, you have my, uh, are here people from Slovenia? <coughs> Latvia? Lithuania? Malta. Malta? Ah, okay. First, my apologies. I haven't yet been uh, to visit you. Second, you see me coming because every time I go to any of our uh, member states and I have a chance to be with our teams, I learn something. And my sense of pride goes up, up, up. So we have four more steps up to go. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the examples and what I learned. I'm only going to, 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 to put uh, an emphasis on one, and this is Japan, the triple disaster in Japan. This was so overwhelming. Uh, how many of you have gone to Japan after the disaster? Are there people who were in the team? That the sheer magnitude really exceeds any imagination. Boats a kilometer inland on top of houses, piles and piles of cars, destruction that is of a kind that still the country is struggling to fully recover, although they have done a marvelous job in recovery. We mobilized upon the request of the uh, uh, Japanese authorities a collective European response. They told us, we are so overwhelmed, please do not come individually. It is good, a good wish, but, but we can't handle uh, all good wishers. So we deployed a 17-member uh, team to the area right next to uh, Fukushima, Ibaraki Prefecture. 
They were there when it was still dangerous, when the uh, Chinese were buying all the iodine salt there was as protection against radiation. Uh, embassies were clo closing in Tokyo. Um, I didn't tell my family I was going before I was there because I knew they would be worried. We all left with uh, uh, little um, uh, Giger counters, uh, radiation counters on, on, on our jackets. Uh, in parentheses, uh, uh, when I came back, I mean, I went there, checked it, came back, and I found out uh, that I got more radiation on the flight from here to Tokyo and back than in, in Ibaraki Prefecture. But it was an example of the courage of, of uh, European civil protection and the incredible competence with, with, with which we delivered seven cargo planes of assistance that ranged from uh, um, uh, dozen meters uh, to suits against radiation, radiation um, blankets, um, um, other necessities, water. Why I am I'm talking about Japan? because out of there I drew three very important conclusions for our work today. One, the magnitude of disasters can be such that, that even the best prepared country, and Japan certainly is one of the best prepared countries, can be brought on its knees. And we need to keep on the back of our mind that we have to figure out a way to think of the unthinkable, to prepare for that kind of unimaginable disasters. Two, the strength of coordinated response. We actually did good, and it is still remembered in Japan. Every time I meet the Japanese, uh, uh, Japanese visitors, they start from, you were with us in our most dire moment of need, thank you. But we succeeded exactly because we can quickly mobilize, coordinate, and deploy as one. Three, Japan, after this triple disaster, is doing what? They're lifting up their standards, capacity. And that is where we also need to be, to strive for excellence, even if we are very good. Are we good enough for the future to come? That is the question I want to frame for today's discussion. In my opening remarks, I, I want to focus on three issues. The context within which we uh, operate, the future of the European civil protection mechanism, and our role in the world. With the example of Japan, I actually stepped already into the context within which we work. In the last 10 years, 1.1 million people, approximately 1.1 million people, lost their lives because of natural disasters, vast majority in poor countries. But we in Europe have not been spared. 100,000 Europeans died, majority from what? Who would say? What is the biggest killer in Europe, disaster killer in Europe? Heat waves. Heat waves, exactly, heat waves. Majority from summer heat, and these are gonna come more often. In these 10 years, it was 1,000 billion euros damage in the world. 2011 being the record high year, over 300 billion. For us in Europe, again, we are not the worst case because our damage was 150 billion euros. What is the biggest cost? What is the disaster that costs us the most in Europe? Hmm? Helena, two times Helena. <laughs> floods, floods, 50% of this damage is due to floods. We saw in Japan, but then we saw it in the United States when Sandy stopped the heart of the US economy the heart of the world economy, and made parts of Manhattan a third world country. No electricity, no drinking water. Some of this is not yet recovered. And what does it mean for us? Well, let me take, move to the second point. 
what does it mean for the European civil protection mechanism that we do have this context? In my view, and I would be very interested in the discussions today and tomorrow, how you see it, the most important adjustment we have to continue to make is lifting up preparedness and prevention in the agenda of civil protection and making it a key element of the EU civil protection mechanism. We must know our risks, what we can do to cope with them with our own capabilities, whether our capabilities are at par with our risks, and also where we could expect disasters that overwhelm us and require a deployment that triggers the, the civil protection mechanism. In 10 years of existence of our civil protection mechanism, it has been activated 180 times. And that means 180 times we have served as buffer for each other and for others that need help around the world. We have taken steps in the new civil protection legislation to move more towards preparedness and prevention but we have taken other steps that bring preparedness and prevention as a horizontal issue for other sectors, because it is not only for us to do. Like we have now included in the environmental impact assessment, a requirement to look into the disaster risks. In structural funds, those, of, those, uh, those that would be used in the future, in the next uh, programming period, we require that disaster proofing is done for investments with long uh, span, with longevity that, that, that would bring them under the wave of climate change, which unfortunately is already with us. And we also have put forward a discussion paper on insurance because the insurance industry can play a huge role in helping us to send the right signal on preparedness prevention and also to mobilize resources so we can cope with damage more effectively. Secondly, what it means for us is to continue to improve our collective response capabilities. In the new legislation, we are moving away from ad hoc to more predictable based on voluntary pool of assets. We are building on a concept that we already have, and that is the concept of modules that are standardized. Where is the Danish? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> the famous Lego concept that Denmark gifted us with to make sure that we can combine different assets from different countries easily because of standardization. And uh, uh, we are moving on this voluntary pool extremely well. We now have uh, 100, almost 150 modules registered at European level. And of course, we want to do, we want to do more. So we, in a sense, we combine two things on one side, since civil protection is primarily national responsibility, we provide through more attention to risk assessment the tools for countries to know what more they need to do to invest in their own skills and capabilities. And on the other hand, through the voluntary pool for extraordinary events, we have the buffer we need in a cost-effective manner. Three, we learned that transportation is always a bottleneck. And therefore, in the new legislation, we want to ease the burden on countries when they come to the rescue of somebody else by lifting up the co-financing from, uh, from the uh, civil protection mechanism. Still a point of debate. I really, really, really hope that we can reach closure so the legislation can move uh, on. Four, information, scenario planning, research, innovation, all of this contributes to enhanced capabilities and speed. Uh, today, we opened up the new emergency response center. 
Uh, how, how many of you were at the uh, inauguration? Uh, oh, well, so, so many people haven't been there. There will be, when I finish talking, there would be a small uh, video to give you a snapshot. Um, as one of us here said, uh, the center for those of us who want to have that information and connectivity capabilities is a dream that comes true. Uh, and we are going to use it collectively, it belongs to all of us, for lifting up capacity to be faster and to be better equipped in decision making because of this ability to process information and make projections for the future better than before. Last but not least, gap identification. We Looking into the future, and remember, uh, actually, Craig Fugato was the, was the person, uh, a FEMA was the person who said that to me, that this is his number one priority, think of the unthinkable. We cannot rely on the experience we have built in the past because we don't know what the future can bring. We do have to develop this gap identification capability and figure out the most cost-effective way to fill these gaps. Again, an issue that is not yet closed in the negotiations on the civil protection. Please, let's get to the bottom of it and close it so we can move on. Let me go to, and, and of course, uh, 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 we will hear from you a lot more on what we can do better. And I can tell you, we are always interested to learn new to, to new concepts to, to develop our, our thinking. Let me go to my third point, and this is our role in the world. We in Europe have a responsibility to connect to others for the benefit of our citizens and also for the benefit of the whole world. We have the Hyogo Framework for Action. 2015 is a very critical year. We must engage with a common European position where we want it to take us. We now know where we are going to meet in 2015, in Sendai, but we need to figure out when we are there, what is it that we are going to say? What is it that we would drive the words toward? Our partnership with OCHA has evolved. I still remember my first days as a commissioner when there was a great deal of uh, anxiety between, among the humanitarian community and the civil protection community, humanitarian community not being sure that it would be easy to get the civil protection community in sync. Uh, and I was, uh, we have made huge progress in identifying mandates, roles, how we work together and where we work together and where we do not work together and why. And I was very pleased to get a letter from Valerie Amos, uh, the UN, the, the UN uh, Undersecretary, uh, congratulating us with the new emergency response center. And I'm just going to quote from this letter. EU civil protection mechanism, key instrument to channel the EU's support to disaster affected people in Europe and beyond. And she wishes us all the best uh, with, the new, with the new center. But this partnership with OCHA is very important because uh, Remember, the countries that, that give most of the victims are developing countries to disasters, are developing countries. And we need to be as effective as possible when we strive to help them. Three in our role of the world is what we do to promote preparedness and prevention in the most vulnerable countries. And this is where our new policy on resilience kicks in. We, Europeans, are in the lead of making sure that the 20 to 30 countries that are most vulnerable to natural disasters are also focus of assistance to communities, to governments, to have the capability to withstand shocks. Four, collaboration with others that are like us. The US, uh, Australia, we have administrative agreements, uh, to work with emerging countries like China, we have opened up EU-China Disaster Management Institute together with member states, making sure that this partnership in China is being built up. 
Uh, with Russia, we heard uh, the Minister of Emercom today congratulating us for the center. With ASEAN, we have to build these this partnerships uh, because in an overwhelming case, we rely on each other. But in terms of mindset change, injecting a culture of prevention, we have to work together to get to, get to that point, to get there. Uh, let me finish with a very uh, simple uh, closure on what I hope is just the beginning of a discussion in, this, uh, in, in uh, today's uh, and tomorrow's forum. And it is, we all, all live in a, in a world that is changing rapidly. In some ways, for the better, it is becoming a richer world. But it is also a more fragile world than the one I was born in. Um, everywhere I go and I talk to people, I hear the same story, mostly because of climate change, but also because of demography, because of industrialization. There are new vulnerabilities or more people affected when something bad happens or more damage imposed. Just two days ago, I was talking to uh, people in, uh, in, the, in, in uh, Jordan, water scarce country, and they were saying that, that they just don't know how they're going to cope as water becomes scarcer and scarcer, and of course they're flooded by refugees. We people are incredibly capable of coping with problems. We are very inventive. But one thing that we have that is our best ally is helping each other, solidarity in front of disaster. And I have seen this solidarity kicking in, the best of people coming true when the worst happens. In Europe, we go now through some difficult times. You read the uh, public opinion and it says, our citizens are more anxious. Their support for the European project in some places has weakened. Not in the work we do. Over 90% of the European people, of our 500 million, want us to be together in the face of this more fragile world. And I'm confident that we can deliver it because I have seen it so many times. The best community of Europe is in this room. The most, the most camaraderie probably per, per, per person, per square meter, per whatever is in this, in this room. Um, once I said, kind of semi-jokingly, if uh, first responders were in charge of the economic crisis, it would have been over a long time ago. So thank you for letting me be your commissioner. I so much, very much, I so much look forward to visit the four countries I haven't been yet to, to exercises and to actions we take together. And I will finish turning to a short video that would show you our new emergency response uh, center. It belongs to all of us and we will make the best of it. Thank you. Dear Chrysalina, distinguished guests, colleagues from the Commission, from the External Action Service, from different, representing different governments, the European Union, from the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It is indeed a pleasure to be here today with you and open this European Emergency Response Centre. As you know, in Europe, on average, every year 10,000 people are tragically killed, 15 billion euro of damage caused by natural and man-made disasters. We need to do all that we can at every level to reduce this terrible toll 
and better protect Europe's citizens. The new Emergency Response Centre will play a central role in this regard. Its core function is to bring together the collective knowledge of and capacity of our Member States. The Centre will also support the Commission's humanitarian interventions and will be able to provide specialist services across the Commission during emergency situations. It will thus help to ensure a better coordinated European response to disasters, avoiding potential duplication and inefficiency. This is a prime example of how more Europe brings added practical, tangible value to our citizens and help us to tackle the challenges we face together. All of this will enable us to build on our experience of European civil protection that has been developed over the past decade, from dealing with the tragic Red Sludge disaster in Hungary to mitigating the impact of the terrible explosion at the Evangelos Florakis naval base in Cyprus. And will enable us to more effectively demonstrate European solidarity at its most fundamental level. Of course, this solidarity also extends to third countries whenever a major disaster strikes. The Commission already coordinated European assistance in international crisis from the 2004 tsunami in Asia. I remember well because it was at the beginning of my first mandate in the Commission, and so we were there, and I cannot forget the words of appreciation and gratitude that were expressed to, to us by the President of Indonesia and by the people of Indonesia. From the tsunami in Asia, I was saying, to the 2007, 2010, I'm sorry, earthquake in Haiti, to the deep water horizon oil spill in the US. This new center will allow us to go a step further. It will enable us to put together a European response that is even faster and even more effective in accordance with the Commission's legislative proposal on a union civil protection mechanism. I would like to call upon both the European Parliament and the Council to rapidly finalize negotiations on this legislation to ensure full continuity in the financial and legal framework for European civil protection. These efforts to improve coordination and cooperation are also being promoted through the Civil Protection Forum, which is being held today and tomorrow. I would like to wish all participants a very successful event. I'd like also to uh, pay a special tribute and have a special word of thanks to Kristalina. Kristalina Georgieva, you know well her enthusiasm, to her, to her team, all those that participated in this very important project, also other colleagues in the Commission, I know, Amara Sevkovic and uh, his services, all of you that have made this possible, my very sincere congratulations and my word of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, in an ideal world in which tragic disaster does not strike, this center would not be needed. However, in the real world, I am proud that together we have established a facility which will help give our citizens the European civil protection they expect and deserve. I thank you for your attention. One, two, three. been on the front line. I'm Craig Fugate, the administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. From the United States of America, and I want to congratulate the EU on the opening of the Emergency Response Center. Mm -hmm. Minister for Russia. Okay. Minister. Позвольте мне от имени сотрудников МЧС России поздравить вас с этим знаменательным событием в жизни Европейского Союза открытием нового центра координации чрезвычайного реагирования. Thank you, Commissioner. And now I'd like to invite you and the rest of our VIP speakers to join me on the stage for our first panel discussion, the European and International Framework for Disaster Management, Prospects for the Future. Thank you.
So during the next hour and a quarter, our team of VIPs will discuss some of the most pressing challenges facing Europe and the international community as they seek to address future civil protection needs and modernise the relevant legislation to tackle them. We will be taking questions from the audience throughout the panel, so if you'd like to ask a question, please do remember to say your name, your organisation, and to whom your question is directed. And please do remember to use your microphone uh, when making the question or asking the question at all during the proceedings. So please do make sure that you press the button. Thank you. Um, we were also expecting to be joined by Margarita Wallström from UNISDR. She's the special representative for the Secretary General, but unfortunately she's not able to join us today. However, I'm very pleased to introduce the rest of our panel. If I start on my right, Michelle Striffler is an MEP, and she's also the Vice Chair of the European Parliament Development Committee and Standing Rapporteur on Humanitarian Aid Issues. And to my far right, Mr. Rudolf Muller is the Deputy Director and Chief of the Emergency Services Branch at UN OCHA in Geneva. Obviously, to my left, we have Commissioner Gordieva. And to her left, we have Elisabetta Gardini, who is the, a member of the European Parliament and a rapporteur for the European Parliament Committee on the Environment. And finally, to my far left, Fergus O'Dowd is Minister of State, Department of the Environment, Community and Local Government for Ireland. Thank you all for joining us. So, I'd like to reflect a little bit on what the Commissioner talked about in her opening speech and some of the challenges that we face in Europe and also at an international level. And so, Elisabetta, or Ms. Gardini, I'd like to start with you, if I may. In your work for the European Parliament's Committee on the Environment, you've been very closely involved in shaping the new civil protection legislation. What do you think are the key challenges that Europe faces when it comes to disaster management and what do you think are the most important issues that need to be addressed in order to meet those challenges? Intanto grazie e un saluto a well, tutti, è veramente emozionante la giornata di oggi. Well, today is a, a very e, moving day. Iniziata con l'inaugurazione del With centro e io permettetemi eh, una grazie di cuore al and nostro commissario Cristalina Gorgheva perché io credo che come ha ricordato anche Barroso il suo entusiasmo, la sua passione, il tanto cuore che ha messo eh, in questi anni, in questi due anni e mezzo, quasi tre oramai di lavoro hanno portato a questo grande risultato, veramente un grande risultato, molte donne coinvolte in questa avventura e lei però la capofila assolutamente di questo progetto, quindi grazie di cuore, l'ho vista anche molto emozionata oggi, credo sia una delle giornate che si è veramente meritata. Moltissime cose le ha già dette lei nel suo discorso introduttivo. Noi capiamo che l'Europa si trova in un mondo globalizzato, in un mondo che sta cambiando, che in parte è già molto cambiato, e ci troviamo ad affrontare delle sfide che sono sfide comuni di tutti, di tutti i paesi del mondo. Abbiamo imparato dal Giappone e ce lo ricorda sempre il nostro commissario che anche il paese che pensava di essere il meglio preparato non era preparato. Abbiamo sentito, l'ha citato prima la, la commissaria, dobbiamo pensare quello che pensavamo di non poter pensare, l'impensabile. Dobbiamo immaginare quello che non... cercare di immaginare quello che sembra non immaginabile. E quindi queste sono le grandi sfide so con le quali noi ci troviamo, anche come Europa, a confrontarci. Ora, eh, la protezione civile europea è un qualche cosa che esiste, è un qualche cosa che eh, ha anche ben funzionato fino ad oggi. Abbiamo tantissime eh, esperienze positive, ma è sicuramente un qualche cosa che possiamo e dobbiamo migliorare. Quindi prima di tutto questo passaggio dal sistema ad hoc al sistema dove eh, si preimpegnano mezzi, capacità, eh, conoscenza, esperti, eh, è la, il grande salto di qualità che ci impegna profondamente perché noi dobbiamo prima di tutto e 
su questo la nostra, la nostra eh, legislazione punta molto, puntare su una cultura della prevenzione, che è forse un grande, il grande nuovo capitolo eh, sul quale noi possiamo, anche grazie alle nuove tecnologie, puntare molto di più. Eh, noi non mi voglio dilungare su, su, su tanti tratti che sono già stati ben ricordati dal Commissario, però io credo che complessivamente noi oggi abbiamo la possibilità di andare incontro, e questo mi sembra appunto politicamente molto importante, per il Parlamento molto importante, di, ci troviamo di fronte alla possibilità di andare incontro alla alla volontà dei cittadini europei che in questo momento di difficoltà e di crisi molto spesso si trovano in altri settori a chiedere meno Europa, questo è uno dei pochi settori in cui chiedono unanimemente più Europa. Allora io credo che politicamente noi non possiamo lasciarci sfuggire questa grande opportunità che questa legislazione ci offre, che questo terreno, questo campo ci offre. Ed è un campo nel quale la percezione dei cittadini, abbiamo detto, da un lato si chiedono più Europa e vogliono che l'Europa sia più presente nella stragrande maggioranza, però soltanto il 38% secondo Eurobarometro è consapevole del ruolo che già ha svolto l'Europa in questo campo, quindi noi eh, abbiamo una straordinaria possibilità dal punto di vista politico e lasciatemi ancora dire un'ultima cosa, che eh, essendo qui... Eh, con la collega, la vicepresidente della Commissione with, uh, Stifler a rappresentare Mrs. il Parlamento, Stifler, credo che il Parlamento questa volta uh, abbia uh, la possibilità di svolgere un ruolo straordinario perché con l'ingresso del uh, Trattato di Lisbona è cambiata completamente non solo la base legale della, the, uh, della legislazione, sulla protezione civile, ma anche cambiato completamente il ruolo del Parlamento ehm, che finalmente si trova per la prima volta ad essere co-legislatore su questa materia che è una competenza parallela rispetto a quella dei Paesi eh, componenti dell'Unione Europea. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Muller, I'd like you to reflect on what Ms. Gardini has said, please, particularly on the um, issue that she raised about needing to build a culture of prevention. Um, in your work at OCHA, what do you think are the main international challenges that need to be addressed? Is prevention one of them when it comes to civil protection? And looking specifically at the role that Europe can play, how do you see that going forward? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, also, thank you very much for inviting OCHA to this very important event and, and congratulations to the Commission about all of you actually to open this center and, and for making this real major step forward also in our collaboration be between uh, the European Union and, and OCHA, uh, in spite of the fact that we had traditionally excellent rel relationship. Uh, I feel also almost a bit embarrassed to speak here in front of uh, this big group of people and many familiar faces actually. It's, uh, it shows how small this community is. Uh, but coming back to your question indeed, I, I think prevention, uh, preparation, mitigation, I mean this whole complex of areas I think we all need to work towards. Uh, and, uh, and not at least, I mean the whole term of resilience came up over the last two, three years so strongly. I think this is the way to go ultimately, but we cannot avoid actually that we have and we are prepared to respond that cap capability always needs to be there. We need to have the strong capability to respond and using all means the international community has. From our point of view and looking at the, the civil protection mechanisms in general, um, I think there is one particular important point is that we always look at these different mechanisms that they are needs driven. They are being used on the basis of needs rather than resources driven. That they are being used without any political motivation. Um, And, and of course, from the United Nations point of view, and, uh, and particularly when you look at the legal framework in which we work, that they are in support of the affected state. Uh, and as you know, OCHA is actually one of the organizations which was established on the basis of a UN resolution, which is the famous uh, Resolution 46182, which outlines actually the framework for international assistance and says clearly we are there to support affected states in support of them, on the basis of a request or a consent of an affected state. Uh, but what actually this mechanism does and what, and what we are particularly pleased with is that it definitely does enhance the, the pre predictability of response. 
uh, and, 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 and probably also the timeliness of response. I mean, this is one of the, these are the important elements of us, and we might actually come in the discussion more to these particular issues. Um, I want to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so prevention, preparation, mitigation, um, enhancing predictability of response and basing, looking at needs rather than resources. Um, Madam Strifler, I would like to turn to you now. You work very closely, well, you're the vice chair, in fact, of the European Parliament Development Committee, and you're also the rapporteur on, on humanitarian issues. Taking a slightly different angle, what do you think is the specific contribution of civil protection when it comes to tackling humanitarian crises? And if, if you would, I would like you to reflect also on, on what Mr. Muller said in his answer. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à toutes et à yes, tous. Et il est vrai que beaucoup de choses ont été dites déjà. Je, 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 je parle de prévention, said, résilience, mais je voudrais uh, aussi I parler de coordination. Et avant de, 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 de répondre à cette question, je voudrais aussi vous rappeler que je suis uh, donc uh, uh, rapporteur pour avis en commission de développement uh, donc pour cette nouvelle législation sur la protection civile. Donc il est très important pour moi d'avoir tous les éléments aujourd'hui. Moi, ce que je voudrais rappeler, c'est que ces catastrophes ont été aggravées très nettement au cours de ces dernières années, mais de façon disproportionnelle. C'est vrai que la majorité des catastrophes, euh, on le sait, euh, ont lieu euh, sur, dans les pays tiers euh, et en dehors de l'Union européenne, bien sûr. Donc, l'Union européenne dispose de deux grands instruments, bien sûr euh, l'aide humanitaire, mais aussi la protection civile. Et il faut bien dire que les États membres ont de plus en plus recours à cette protection civile euh, pour répondre aux catastrophes qui surviennent dans ces pays tiers. Euh, dans le cas de catastrophes naturelles, les moyens euh, de protection civile euh, peuvent contribuer très, très sensiblement aux actions euh, sur la base, bien sûr, d'évaluation des besoins humains mais parce qu'ils ont aussi beaucoup d'avantages et on peut offrir beaucoup d'avantages en termes de, de, de rapidité et d'expertise sectorielle euh, et d'efficacité en particulier au cours de la première phase euh, des opérations de secours. Donc euh, nous avons vu euh, le parfait exemple en Haïti et comme le disait Mme Gurjeva euh, tout à l'heure, là nous avons eu un exemple parfait en termes de contribution de l'utilité de la protection civile dans une situation d'urgence humanitaire très grave. Et donc, en effet, à cette occasion-là, 25 pays se sont déployés et ont participé à la mise à la disposition donc de, ces, de toutes ces équipes de, 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 de recherche, des moyens, toutes ces équipes de recherche, surtout les recherches de, de survivants, donc sous les décombres. Donc, nous avons bien vu que les ONG à elles seules n'auraient pas pu euh, réaliser euh, toutes ces opérations euh, qui étaient plus qu'urgentes euh, à ce moment-là. Donc, euh, ma euh, position aujourd'hui, c'est, euh, comme vous l'avez dit tout à l'heure, prévention, résilience, mais surtout une excellente coordination entre les deux après une évaluation, bien sûr, euh, au cas par cas. Voilà. Thank you very much. Commissioner, I'd like to get a quick view from you at this point. Thank you. The, let me just reflect on two things. One, what we just heard from uh, uh, Madame Strifler on the criticality of mobilizing civil protection assets in devastating disasters where the local capabilities, the capabilities of the humanitarian community uh, are overwhelmed. We, they are case, we, we, we must do more of it because we all live in a world where needs are growing but resources are not. And we have to use what we have to the fullest in the best possible way. But, as uh, Ms., uh, uh, Ms. Madame Strifler said, and I don't want this point to be lost, it is always case-specific. What we could do in Haiti, we couldn't do in Pakistan, because in one case it was a natural disaster in a country with very weak institutional capacity. The other case was a natural disaster, floods in a country in a conflict, where NATO is a site in a sense, part of the, the take side in this conflict, uh, and uh, uh, 
some of our member states are also members of, of NATO. But does it mean that we did not use civil protection in Pakistan? No, it doesn't. What we did was we mobilized capabilities, assets, we put it on a plane, the plane landed, and from there on, we took it very, I mean, actually it was a NATO plane in one case, landed, but then we took it and we distributed it with organizations that were, were compatible with local conditions. They can work in these local conditions. Uh, so the, the, the main issue here for us is to work very closely with the humanitarian community and not be, not be preju pre prejudging what can and cannot be done because it always would be case specifics, specific. But this is where comes my second point. Over the years, what we have developed in the civil protection mechanism is the rapid assessment teams. We have the capability to deploy and make judgments. In other words, have this knowledge of what are the specifics. And over the years, they have increased in, 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 in nervous. Um, they also have increased in sophistication of how they operate. Uh, they have improved in simplicity of how they, how they can operate. Uh, and, and that is, in, in a sense, what we see in our civil protection mechanism is that every deployment has taught us a lesson. And I would say something to uh, look at the other people. For us, with my other hat as a humanitarian commissioner, there is something for us to learn in the humanitarian side from the civil protection mechanism in terms of drawing lessons and then incorporating these lessons in what we do uh, next because every single deployment in our case, every single activation would end up with lessons being drawn and then utilized uh, in, in the future. Um, so um, uh, uh, probably the best thing we, we now do is having these different perspectives on, on, this pa on this panel and they really reflect the different standpoints necessary in today's world. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, before we move on to talking specifically about some of the legislation and the updating of, of the civil protection mechanism, I would like to bring, actually, at this point I will bring in the Minister, um, because we are going to talk about that. Uh, Minister, the Irish Presidency is steering the Council through the process of, of defining this new civil protection legislation, which we've already heard made mention of many times this afternoon. What are the elements that all member states have already agreed upon? And well, do you think that they are ambitious enough? Well, I think, first of all, that uh, of the 36 items, I think 32 of them have actually been agreed. So most countries agree on most things, and I think we're all stepping up to the mark. And can I uh, reflect the views of the Commissioner also? Like her, we hold the presidency for this short period, and in that role I've been to Fukushima, I've been there at a nuclear safety conference, and I've seen the, you know, the no, nobody can live within the 10 kilometre zone. Uh, I've seen the effect of that. I've been personally to the Rockaways in New York, and I've seen, you know, the effects of climate change there. But I suppose, representing the presidency recently in Berlin, the most striking and chilling comment I ever heard about climate change was from the representative of Bangladesh, who said that up to 30 million people in Bangladesh will lose their livelihood, lose their property, lose their homes, lose everything as a result of climate change in the future, unless we have proper mitigation in place. And I suppose that uh, I think that's very clear from what happened this morning, uh, as President Barroso said, that he hoped that we can bring finality shortly to this legislation. But I'd just like to say that uh, everybody that's in this room today is doing a job, you know, for, for, for the, obviously for their country and, and for humanity in the broadest possible sense. And I think the increased cooperation between member states, the, fast, the fact that each of us has a risk, uh, a risk assessment in place, that it is peer reviewed, that we work on best practice, that we work with the United Nations, that we, we're, ready, we're ready, willing and able to assist in every possible way. I think that's really the measure uh, of the European Union. That's the strength that we have working together. Uh, whatever the, the four items are, and I understand their financial issues, I think they pale in, in significance with the effort, with the support, with the success that there is here today. And finally, I suppose listening today in that room, listening to President Barossa, looking and not speaking to, but listening to the guy in Washington and listening to the gentleman from Russia, 
uh, as well. That shows you how interconnected we are and how ready, willing and able we all are to respond to every possible humanitarian crisis that we can in the best possible way. And I think it's full marks to the EU for that. Thank you. So I should take it that you think it is ambitious enough then? Definitely, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'd like to take a few questions from the audience. So if you'd like to ask a question to somebody on the panel, please do raise your hand. Remember to use your microphone and say your name and organisation. So do we have any questions, please? Yes, lady in the fourth row. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paola Brito from UNISTR. Uh, thank you very much for these wonderful comments from the panel. Extremely interesting to see how we're moving forward in disaster prevention. Um, I have a question for Ms. Georgieva, but in fact, everybody is very welcome to respond to it. And the question is the following. What do you think Europe can do more in order to move forward investments in prevention. We know that it is extremely important. We know and there is a will to move it forward in terms of uh, legislation and knowledge. And yet, what else can we do collectively in Europe to ensure that we are building resilient society? Um, I'm, I'm really glad that you um, send the question to everybody because I would be interested to hear views from other, other panelists on it. It is a crucial question. I mean, look, globally, we have the pyramid of prevention and response turned upside down because globally, we spend much more on response than we spend on preparedness and prevention. And the poorer the country, the more uh, the pyramid is like this. Uh, we, just to give you, give you a kind of a number, it is 2-3% only of development money that is associated with disasters, but the vast majority of the money goes in response, not in preparedness and, and prevention. Uh, we know that one euro invested in prevention, four to seven euros in, pre in damage is reduced. We know that. So why are we not doing it? I have three, three uh, explanations, and therefore strategy built on addressing those. One, we don't do it because the risks are not for everyone, and they are in the future. Whereas the investment to be made should be investment by, by many of us, even if the risk for us individually is small. So it is a classical sort of prison, prisoner's dilemma. In other words, you, I mean, it, it, not, in, not my problem, therefore I shouldn't be paying. And so we have to equalize the incentives. And this is where the insurance industry is very critical. This is where regulation that requires we invest more in prevention is very critical. Secondly, it's a little bit human psychology. Uh, we all know that we should exercise more, and we know that uh, those who smoke die earlier. Uh, but we still <laughs> don't exercise enough, and we, some of us still smoke. Uh, and that, that is, uh, when it comes down to, to psychology, if you take the smoking as a, as a parallel problem, how do you address it with massive information on the risks? And that massive in information we haven't yet done. You know, my dream is that we would have, if you are in a flood area, that it would be like when you get your cigarette package now and it is written with these big letters, smoking kills, that we have with these big letters, living in the flood areas kills. Uh, we have to be, we have to take this information on, on disaster risk, but of course, to do it, we, know, we need to know what the risks are. And, and to, be, to be fair, not everywhere we have done this, uh, uh, this work. And my... Third uh, explanation is response is sexy. So let's be honest about it. Responding, you're on the screen, disaster, the flames are going, you come with a plane, it is sexy. Preparedness, resilience, not sexy. <laughs> now, how to make it <laughs> sexy? Uh, is frankly is a tough job. Uh, if, uh, if you allow me, I'll, I'll tell you just one anecdote because it is very telling. 
February last year, I was in, uh, in uh, Chad. A huge drought hitting again the Sahel region. And uh, a journalist from BBC is interviewing me. And he says, Commissioner, how are you going to assure me that if I come in June, I'm not going to be filming starving children? And I said, because I'm here in February and we are taking action in February. And indeed, we prevented catastrophe. And then I asked him a question and I said, how are you going to assure me that if there are no starving children in June, you will be here to report on it? He sure wasn't there. And that is, and that is a major problem that we need to engage with the media. We need to, we need to think how to make this sexier. Thank you very much. Okay, so I think I've got responses is, is sexy, whereas resilience is not. Um, we've also got the risks are not the same for everyone, so, and they're in the future. And, the, so, and then also human psychology, we know so, we should do something, but we still don't do it. Um, I'd like to bring Ms. Gardini in on this point as well, just to reflect on the question, because this question of collective um, action is also a way of saying, how do we avoid duplication? And I'd be very interested to hear your view on that. How do you think member states can avoid duplication of efforts and work together, particularly at a time when European governments are cutting budgets? And then, Minister, I will get a comment from you afterwards. Thank you. Sì, questo è un punto fondamentale e credo che sia eh, un qualche cosa che coinvolge anche le nostre diverse esperienze sul campo, perché non dimentichiamo che siamo 27 paesi, quasi 28, eh, con eh, problemi molto diversi e nella discussione che sta avvenendo a livello del Consiglio questo è proprio emerso con forza. Però abbiamo visto che piano piano, sotto anche la guida sapiente delle varie presidenze, Eh, ultima ma eh, brillantissima della, dell'irlandese eh, le questioni si sono andate via via sciogliendo però siamo partiti da esperienze straordinariamente diverse tant'è che si è deciso nella legislazione di non dare la definizione di protezione civile e credo che questo sia un punto che la dice lunga perché ognuno di noi sul campo eh, è abituato ad operare in, con mezzi diversi perché si trova ad affrontare problemi diversi. Allora la teoria spesso ci ha diviso, però scendendo nel concreto siamo riusciti spesso, sempre, quasi siamo arrivati al traguardo finale a trovare la eh, mediazione. Perché io credo che mai come in questo campo quello che serve è l'esperienza concreta e eh, allora eh, tutto quello che noi stiamo mettendo in campo è fatto proprio perché in questi momenti anche di ristrettezze economiche ma di aumento di bisogno eh, ci sia la possibilità di mettere insieme e condividere le esperienze, le best practices, le finanze scarse, ma che devono per questo essere sfruttate al meglio, essere messe a eh, rendere il massimo e per questo dobbiamo evitare doppioni, dobbiamo semplificare, dobbiamo, noi ten- cerchiamo di eliminare burocrazia, cerchiamo di valorizzare e tenere in conto, e questi sono tutti emendamenti presentati anche dal, dal Parlamento, di tenere eh, conto delle varie competenze che già esistono anche all'interno dei vari paesi, quindi abbiamo dato molto rilievo anche a quelle che sono le realtà territoriali e questo credo sia un elemento che va a vantaggio di questo questa strategia comune. Tant'è che in Parlamento, e questo io ci terrei a sottolinearlo, abbiamo sempre avuto l'opportunità di lavorare praticamente all'unanimità. Lo abbiamo fatto con il documento, con il primo documento presentato dalla Commissione, sul quale c'è stato il voto in plenaria praticamente all'unanimità, e l'abbiamo fatto anche con questo secondo testo, che ovviamente è più difficile perché entriamo nel legislativo, ma dove in Commissione abbiamo praticamente trovato una sorta di unanimità. Ecco, io credo che questo sia eh, fondamentale, Eh, condividere quello che noi conosciamo. Abbiamo visto che cosa può, anche anche i paesi del nord, che hanno poca 
per e loro no. fortuna eh, mm. attitudine alla, alle catastrofi che invece Luckily, il Sud conosce in maniera purtroppo frequente. Pensiamo solo a quello che è successo con l'eruzione del vulcano islandese. Uh, allora, quando c'è stata l'eruzione del vulcano, quali sono state le perdite nel momento in cui semplicemente abbiamo dovuto tenere a terra tutti gli aeroplani europei? Ecco, e adesso l'Islanda possiede una tecnologia che è stata fornita dall'Italia per misurare no, quanta cenere, quante polveri ci sono nell'aria e probabilmente adesso di fronte ad un'altra emergenza simile si potrebbe essere più precisi e non tenere a terra gli aeroplani solamente a scopo precauzionale, ma li potremmo tenere a terra solo se effettivamente ci fosse la necessità di tenerli a terra. Questo è un, soltanto un piccolo esempio, ma per quanto riguarda un altro esempio mi sembra fondamentale, quello di andare a colmare la scarsità di mezzi in alcuni settori, soprattutto in quelle catastrofi che sono cosiddette no, ad alto impatto ma bassa probabilità. Le eh, dispersioni di petrolio in mare probabilmente è una di quelle e noi lì eh, probabilmente ma sicuramente abbiamo più interesse, spendiamo di meno e siamo più efficienti e più efficaci se condividiamo dei mezzi e non chiediamo ad ogni paese di fornirsi del mezzo per rispondere ad una catastrofe che ha una bassa probabilità di accadere ma ha un altissimo impatto. Ecco, credo che nella nostra legislazione abbiamo cercato proprio di tenere come stella polare eh, questa, 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 questa idea di eh, ottimizzare, di rendere efficiente, efficace e di ottimizzare le risorse di tutti i tipi, eh, quelle finanziarie in primis, ma anche tutte le altre tipi di risorse tecnologiche, eh, di conoscenza, di esperti, di esperienza e credo che questo lo si possa vedere leggendo, eh, leggendo proprio la nostra, il nostro documento e tutto quello che, 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 si, sta, che si sta facendo. Thank you. Um, Minister, we've had this sort of picture painted of the different experiences and, and knowledge uh, pools that the different member states bring to the equation. How do you coordinate these very different experiences um, into a more efficient collective approach? I suppose it has to be by consensus, obviously. People step up, as I said earlier, what each country is going to do, how we cooperate together. But there's a, a broader picture out there is I think the I think it's 400 parts per million now is the latest measure of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the, the two degrees centigrade limit, which we're trying to put on our, our, our world uh, increase in temperature, it, I, it's going to be very difficult to, to keep below that. And I think mo one of the most important things, whatever each individual country can do in terms of renewable energy, in terms of looking at the issue of climate change in the future, and we all have to step up to the mark as EU countries in relation to what's going to replace the Kyoto, what we're going to do for 2020. And one of the big things I think we can do individually, and I, I don't know if maybe the European Parliament could, could advise on this, is if we, if we look at renewable energy, if we look at the green economy, if we look at reducing our dependence in our own economy, wherever it is on fossil fuels, if we all get into our electric cars or our public transport, you know, we really have to change the, the things we're doing so that uh, people out there in more difficult uh, geographic situations, you know, we can mitigate the impact of climate change. So I'd say in answer to the question, uh, does what we can do ourselves, but I think we've got to look at the big picture and we've got to step up to the mark the way that we have done in the past. Uh, but I think that we really, really, really have to get real radical change in how we view actually the way we live, how we consume products you know, that, 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 you know, that are rare and scarce, how we get to work, you know, how we think, all of those things. So it's a very broad answer to the question. But if we don't step up to it, I think one of the serious issues is the question of international water shortages. I think in about 10, 15 years, there's something like 40% of the world economies will, will well, sorry, population will have serious difficulties with water. You know, they're the things we have to change. Uh, and that's how we can mitigate what we'll have to do collectively in the future, both within and outside our boundaries. Thank you. So what you're saying is Europe needs to get its house in order if it's going to offer a, a sort of appropriate model and support to the rest of, of the world. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam Striffler. Quick comment from you. Oui. Oui, je vais être très rapide parce que beaucoup de choses ont été dites, mais je crois que la question initiale, c'était comment encourager les investissements. Donc, effectivement, je crois que je vais répondre assez vite en étant peut-être un, un petit peu plus sèche. Ici, nous sommes entre, entre nous, dirais-je, entre deux, deux, nous, nous sommes des gens convaincus, nous voulons travailler pour le développement, nous voulons travailler pour l'aide humanitaire, et c'est ce que nous faisons. Mais encourager les investissements, qui dit investissement, dit retour sur investissement. Moi, je pense que nous sommes, nous vivons quand même dans un monde euh, un peu égoïste, et euh, j'entends parler dépenser moins, moi je voudrais... Je préfère pas dire dépenser mieux. Nous y arriverions si euh, nous travaillions un peu plus encore. C'est ce que nous sommes en train de faire sur euh, ce qu'on appelle euh, le lien entre urgence et, et développement. Je crois aussi que nous devons mieux communiquer expliquer au gouvernement que si nous travaillons sur les risques, nous allons gagner de l'argent sur les dépenses. Nous devons euh, expliquer aux différents gouvernements euh, que euh, si nous ne faisons rien, si nous diminuons les budgets, de toute façon, nous allons être obligés de dépenser le triple, voire le quintuple, pour les conséquences de ce que nous n'aurons pas fait en prévention. Donc, pour répondre euh, à, à, à cette question, c'est tout simplement mieux communiquer et expliquer le retour sur investissement, parce que moi, je ne crois pas que le monde est aussi beau et aussi gentil que nous le sommes peut-être dans cette commission. Voilà. In the commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so better explanation on the return on investment in future. Do we have any more questions at this point? Yes, gentlemen there. Thank you. Uh, Fausto Mariccioni, Marche Polytechnic University, Italy. Uh, Madam Commissioner, uh, distinguished members of the panel, uh, we have heard uh, about uh, developing a culture of prevention or achieving standards of uh, emergency management. Um, do you envision an integrated role for universities to achieve this? Something like uh, uh, what the US Federal Emergency Management did uh, with the higher education program. Uh, thank you. Commissioner, would you like to take that question? Just to clarify, are you seeing this purely in a European sense or do you see it broader than that and, and more international? Well, starting at least at the European uh, level. Okay. Commissioner, I'll, I'll pass that to you and then perhaps Mr. Muller will make a comment on that too. Thank you. Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, education, not only university, but also school education, critical to help in this uh, mind, uh, mindset change there are now many universities that are already uh, offering to students courses in disaster manager, management and prevention. Uh, but what is happening is these are specialized courses in specialized universities. The economic, the economic universities are also picking up on this issue of one, one euro in prevention, four to seven euros uh, saved. Uh, but it is again in specialized uh, uh, segment. What is necessary is horizontal, integrating it in everything you do. If you are an engineer, if you are a, especially water, water resource engineer, what do we need to, to, to know? And that should be part element of, of the education. Uh, we, in some of our member states, a lot is being done. And this is uh, another contribution of the civil protection mechanism to bring best practice so we can, we can uh, move in, in this direction more. I actually see, and, and by the way, we, uh, in our approach in the commission, we are targeting our commissioner for education because we believe it is crucial to have that uh, uh, element integrated. Uh, when we did our analysis of who we need to target to be effective in, uh, in our preparedness, prevention, resilience uh, uh, shift, we concluded that everybody we have to target, the only, with the exception of the commissioner for competition. This is where we said, no, okay, competition, we don't see it. Uh, and of course, prioritize among those, but education for us is among the, it is in our sort of second tier of priority, not in the last, not in the top, uh, but, but a high, high, high priority. And uh, uh, if you have any thoughts on, on this, uh, please do share it. And actually, I look at, uh, um, uh, Klaus Sorison here, our Director General, 
we should put on the agenda of our civil protection mechanism to specifically engage on, on this question of how education, primary, secondary, and university education can be a platform for uh, change. I could not agree more with the minister that with climate change, we are actually running, we are against, working against time, that it is to mitigate, to reduce the impact, but also, frankly speaking, the uh, train has left the station. We also need to adapt. And adaptation is so close to what we do in uh, uh, disaster preparedness, disaster management. Uh, a, a huge, huge, huge job for us. Thank you. Mr. Muller, broadening this out to a global level, is this a, a view that you share could work, a more integrated academic network to explain uh, the sort of civil protection issues and, and to make it a more coordinated approach at an academic and learning level? Is this something that you see working internationally as well? Thank you. It's, it's actually really a good question or a good point. It's not really entirely new. I think this has happened over the years. I'm looking more from a responder perspective. Uh, if, I mean, I started actually my, my life in the disaster management uh, after the Armenia earthquake, so it's almost exactly 25 years ago where it was very uh, primitive, uh, the way we worked, and now it's completely changed. The whole landscape, landscape changed, and we use uh, completely different technologies, which are largely because of the involvement of the, of the scientific community and, and, the, and the universities in this. And I just wanted to flag a few things. We have the NOAA program in, in Europe uh, on humanitarian assistance. You have all kinds of, of, of scientific institutions which get involved in, in databases and statistics, cred, uh, insurance companies, Munich reinsurance, etc. So you have a lot of data, and the scientific community has been actually involved in internationally. This has to be expanded. I mean, there is a lot of uh, initiatives going on, but that means it has also to continue, and it has to be sustained. And, and these data should be used, actually, to, be, to do this education which was raised, so in order to make people aware of the risks they have. Uh, because these statistics, as I said, largely kind of are being built up, particularly in Europe, and this has to be expanded over the globe. I mean, we see very, very positive developments in Asia. We see positive developments in Latin America, maybe less so in Africa. So this has also to be fostered and, and promoted. So I think Europe could also play a role as, as facilitator, as supporter of these initiatives in other parts of the world, and it has to continue. And I could go on with this for quite, quite a long period of time, but I think we need all to use and pull these resources together, use of technology, use of scientific knowledge, uh, use of, uh, of uh, statistics which are available. I just learned that Munich Reinsurance has 30 years of experience in statistics in terms of, uh, of, of uh, climate-related disasters and emergencies. Has it been really used? Have we learned the lessons? Not always, I think, and this should be used by, by the overall disaster management community and those who do actually prevention, preparedness, mitigation, resilience, if you wish. Thank you. Actually, I'd like to stick with you just for the moment, Mr. Muller. You talk about Europe's facilitating role in this context, um, but broadening it out to um, looking more generally at better coordinated EU civil protection and humanitarian aid in emergencies. Going forward, how does the UN stand to benefit from a more joined-up approach, more coordinated approach in Europe? I mean, uh, the, the, the establishment of the mechanism for us, and particularly the ERC, for us gives us the opportunity to bring or to have one entry point instead of 32 or 27. I heard that 20, 32 actually are part of this. So this is already a huge step forward. Even so, we, we do have individual contacts, of course, to, to the community here. Uh, but, but that is a major step forward. So that actually does give us, first of all, it facilitates our role. It's just one message instead of 32. It's, I mean, very practical terms. And also, we don't have actually to negotiate. You do that work for us, and that actually helps us a lot in order to facilitate. What it has to be, it has, of course, also to be predictable. And, and, uh, and, and here, the appeal from my side, actually, that, of course, all the member states do also com or, or stand by their commitments they make. And that makes all our lives easier. But I think that is, for us, a major, major step forward. We had already an excellent relationship with the MIC, with all the colleagues here, with Mr. Sorensen, et cetera. But, but I think the creation of the ERC as such does actually help us a lot and will help, help us a lot in the future. And we will deepen this relationship, of course. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner, I'd like to talk, uh, turn to the civil protection legislation once again now. Once it's adopted, it's going to mark an important shift um, towards coordinated disaster response, as we've heard. But in your view, what's the mechanisms and the Commission's role in the international framework for disaster management going forward? 
Once it is adopted, it would bring us much more front and center in this whole discussion on preparedness, prevention, acting early, acting more effectively. What is going to change for us in the Commission, for my colleagues that are in the mechanism? Uh, well, let me first start from what is not going to change. What is not going to change is the importance of our member states being those who build up capabilities and who manage their own deployments. We are building a stronger EU civil protection capacity, but we are building it bottom-up, not top-down. In other words, I have said that many times, you will not see me in front of a um, uh, firefighting helicopter parked next to the Berlamont. <laughs> that is not going to change. What is going to change for us, though, in, in our team are three things, and they're very important, and they do have international implication. First, we are moving to 24-7 operation and capacity to manage European response to multiple crises at the same time. This is a resource for all of us, for all our member states, because we will have a professional team there connecting to all of you, so we process information in a much more rapid and effective manner. Secondly, what is going to change is our capability to do predictions, scenario planning, and consequences of these scenarios from prevention to response. And you will see, you, uh, when you were today, in the, those of you who were in the center today, and I would encourage everybody here Take 15 minutes, go and see it. It is a fantastic resource, and I'm sure we can organize. I'm looking at poor Hans, who is, who is, who is barely alive. Um, but I'm still sure we can organize for those who want to visit it, visit. Yes, Hans? Um, that is... <laughs> yeah, he, now, now is the moment he, he does not love his commissioner that much. <laughs> but, but it is important that those who were there saw how we have joined with our joint research center and we have qualitatively and quantitatively lifted up our capabilities to do scenario planning, to assess information. And the third thing that is going to change is we now have a platform with the new legislation, with the emergency response center, to connect with the international community, with the states, with, with, with Russia, with other countries, to build a global platform for, for preparedness and for response in a way that, that when we didn't have the voluntary pool, we didn't have the, 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 the pooling and sharing capacity, we could not do. So today, actually, I can say with hand on heart, we, you know, I, I, I trust the minister we would get the legislation soon. We get this legislation. We as Europeans are stronger and we can deliver better to our citizens but also play a bigger role uh, in the world, the world in, the, in the big world. Thank you very much. Any more questions at this point? We've got a lady in the second row and a gentleman here. I'll take, I'll take both together actually. So the lady first and then sir. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alicia Bala. I'm representing the ASEAN Southeast a Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. My question is, how does uh, EU engage the civil society organizations in the work of disaster risk reduction and management? Thank you. So question on CSOs, and yes, sir, please, what's your question? Thanks. It's more comment, Horst Miska. A German Civil Protection Commission, but I'm speaking on my own here and as former worker in the MIG. Uh, regarding the new legislation, why it doesn't work or why there's still opposition there, I think some of the northern member states are afraid they have to pay too much compared to others in the south or so. And you spoke about prevention, so I think we have another European mechanism, the ESM now, European Stability Mechanism, and this also works with very strict rules for all countries. So if you 
could get up more strict rules regarding prevention, I think then the opposition in northern member states might diminish. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, would you like to address the last question and then yeah. perhaps, Madame Strifler, you could address the question on engaging CSOs? Um, but you, it is indeed a matter of finding the right balance between net payers and, and those who, who receive assistance. And uh, we have worked very hard to find this balance. First, by, by putting the emphasis on risk profiles and assessing capabilities for each country to manage its risks. This is very new in the legislation, and this should alleviate the fears of the northerners that there will be free riders among the rest, because other countries, when they know their risks better, what do they do? They actually increase their capabilities. I can give you two examples of recent months, in my own country, Bulgaria and Slovakia, where the countries are tapping into structural funds, EU funds, to increase their capabilities to deal with the risks that they now understand better. And other countries can do the same. We now have a mechanism with the legislation to encourage good behavior, prudent behavior, than we didn't have before, and that should go should go to alleviate these fears. But secondly, now let's be very, very uh, honest in this room. What are we talking about as money? As the minister said, first the package in the, in the, in the proposal of, of the Commission for the Civil Protection is already there. You have agreed, the, the member states have agreed on this package. It's there. So it is a matter of an increment, which I believe is in the order of 5 million euros that we are still negotiating over. Am I right, Minister? Uh, I don't actually. Oh, okay. I I'm looking at my hands. <laughs> 5 million. Now, I want to ask us, I mean, let, if, if we want to be really, really honest, how on earth will 5 million euros, which is a, a a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of our budget going to be moral hazard. It cannot. It just doesn't have the power to do it. So my, I think now we are at the point when we really have to take a deep breath and say the North has gotten a lot from this legislation, especially in the mandate of preparedness and prevention. <laughs> We don't have a big moral hazard risk because the amount we are talking about is small and the budget is already agreed. Uh, so uh, my sentiment on this, I mean, I have worked, uh, those of you who know me, I have worked in the World Bank for many, many years. I come with a very prudent uh, financial mindset. I am actually very much on the issue that we should not create moral hazard and we should make sure that countries build up their own capabilities the bottom-up approach to, to civil protection mechanism. And I, in my hearts of heart, I think that we have gone a very long way to do the right thing for our citizens. My fear is that over a tiny, tiny thing, we should not, uh, you know, we shouldn't, put, how was it called? You put a uh, drop of uh, um, poison in a barrel of honey. We have the honey. Let's hold on it. Yeah? Time to eat it. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the bottom-up approach there, and I'd actually like to come back to the lady from ASEAN at this point, because you talked about how the EU could engage civil society. Could you expand on that slightly more, just so that I can um, direct it the question appropriately on the panel? Thank you. Um, I'm trying to find out how are you engaging, what's the, the form of engagement with CSOs when it comes to disaster risk reduction and management? If I, I abuse my, my sitting here in the center, but just to say that in Europe, we are incredibly fortunate because most of our member states have built their civil protection capabilities on the basis of small core of professionals and an army of volunteers. Italy has 1.3 million volunteers. So in a sense, Germany is built all on the principle of volunteering. Uh, so in a sense, 
the civil protection system itself is a civil society organization which is regulated and helped. And when it comes down to preparedness and prevention, we have many uh, think tanks and, and uh, uh, grassroots organizations that operate in this field. But we are finding that we have less capacity in this area, in preparedness and prevention, both at home and when we go and work uh, uh, overseas, than we have on the response side. And again, this is the, the same question, how we can make uh, a preparedness more sexy. Uh, and actually, for, for Europe, I don't want to miss this point on the sexiness. We can develop business opportunities in preparedness and prevention. I mean, take flood management. We have a whole country, the Netherlands, that lives below sea level and has a huge industry of managing how to live below sea level that can be very useful to many countries in your part of the world as such. So we, we, should, we should not forget that, that preparedness and prevention and disaster management is not only a cost, it is a huge potential uh, benefit and business opportunity for Europe. Thank you very much. Okay, looking to the future, um, Madame Striffler. Oh, we have one more question? Okay, sir, yes. Muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Thank Juan Pedro much. Laore. Uh, Trabajo para Protección Laure. Civil España. Llevo Spain. muchos años trabajando con la Comisión. Quisiera subrayar dos cosas importantes. Primera, important señora Georgieva. Usted ha llevado a cabo un trabajo muy importante. Enhorabuena. Lo que tenemos en el ARC es algo que merece la Segundo tema, la gotita de veneno. Por favor. El presupuesto, no le voy a decir lo que se gasta la ciudad de Madrid en emergencia. Una ciudad normal. Se viene a gastar 120 millones al año de euros. Tercer punto. No tienen ustedes muchos ustedes idea, como nosotros los españoles y mis hermanos portugueses tenemos de la tremenda importancia que representa el mecanismo como bandera europea en los países del exterior. España y Portugal somos, trabajamos en una asociación de países iberoamericanos que agrupa desde el Río Grande hasta el Cabo de Hornos. Ahora mismo estamos dando un curso de gestión a la élite de especialistas sudamericanos. Estaba usted hablando, señora Georgieva, de la importancia de la prevención y preparación. Ya ese tema, tanto Portugal como España hemos predicado y ya la gente llama al mecanismo directamente. Estamos esperando para poder dar unas ideas generales de lo que en mi punto de vista de prevención y preparación se está haciendo en Europa. Con todo esto, muchas gracias, porque han hecho ustedes un trabajo increíble. Y los veteranos sabemos de dónde hemos salido, sabemos a dónde hemos llegado. Muchas gracias. No, okay, thank you. Commissioner, do you want to come back on that or no? Uh, well, the, uh, I, I want to thank you and, and everybody uh, who has been working on building up the EU civil protection capability and, and the mechanism. Uh, maybe a good time for me to say that, uh, uh, to reflect on what you said, for a short period of time, we are in existence only 10 years. We have gone a long way. But the problems in the world have become more complex. So we have to take the high road and go even further. Thank you very much. Okay, looking to the future, um, Madame Striffler, to what extent do you think disaster risk reduction and civil protection are going to be essential for achieving international goals like the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, and the climate agenda. And 
what concrete commitments do you want to see Europe and its member states making? So at a commission level, at a member state level, but also at a parliamentary level, what are the concrete commitments that need to be made to make sure that those targets are met? Yeah, je crois tout d'abord que tout, tout, de, tout well, doit être fait sur, euh, all, déjà en respectant les principes, bien I sûr, du consensus humanitaire, européen humanitaire et euh, aux directives des Nations Unies. Mais je crois aussi que ce recours and, uh, euh, doit être vraiment fondé sur les besoins, euh, les besoins réels et doivent être de toute façon complémentaires et plus cohérents avec l'aide humanitaire. Ce qui a très bien marché, et, euh, ce sont les modules, le module, les modules de protection civile qui sont Civil absolument indispensables et qui ont, on l'a vu, well, euh, ça a été dit tout à l'heure euh, sur le Pakistan, etc., There's ont vraiment complété euh, ces actions humanitaires. Really Donc, moi, je dirais qu'un mécanisme de, de protection civile euh, mieux coordonné, plus efficace, c'est ce que j'attends de la Commission, c'est ce que j'attends euh, du Parlement, c'est ce que j'attends de tous les partenaires. Euh, à partir du moment où ce mécanisme est mieux coordonné, il sera plus efficace, il sera plus rapide et ne pourra que mieux compléter toutes les actions uh, more euh, des, 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 speedy euh, des, des différents partenaires humanitaires. And we'll be able Dans la to proposition work with all législative, partners. Euh, la prévention euh, montre bien qu'elle euh, est d'une est importance essentielle car elle va apporter, de toute façon, engendrer une réduction significative euh, des catastrophes elles-mêmes du coût et bien sûr, des conséquences. Je crois que cette proposition de la Commission, pour moi, elle est vraiment excellente. Et j'attends vraiment euh, qu'elle soit suivie, qu'elle soit euh, entendue et suivie et par tous les, les, les acteurs, euh, euh, que ce soit au Parlement ou à la Commission. Et je crois que ça a vraiment été dit euh, concernant toutes les questions qui ont été posées depuis le début. On a tous parlé de, euh, vraiment de, de, de capacité à coordonner des capacités à diminuer le coût et vraiment une meilleure coordination et un apport suite de cette, comment dire, je ne trouve pas le mot que je veux utiliser, mais vraiment apporter cette coordination pour permettre une efficacité, la coordination de cette protection civile. Mais n'oublions jamais qu'il faut également toujours respecter les principes du consensus européen, les principes sur l'aide humanitaire et, humanitaire et les directives des Nations Unies. The um, directives of the uh, United Nations and the Text on Humanitarian Aid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, quick view from you. Uh, just very quickly, I think, I think we, we've, everything is on the table as, as regards what every country is going to do. We know what's in the legislation, we know what's going to happen. I'll just go back to one issue uh, against the climate change issue, and I'll just put it to you this way that uh, youth unemployment is absolutely. Uh, extremely high right across the EU. I think in my country it's 25-30% among some cohorts. It's even higher in other countries. I think if we had and challenged, and I'm talking just uh, not as presidency here, just uh, speaking personally, that if we had a plan right across our countries to, to, you know, to green our economy, as I said earlier, to get young people back to work, to give them a real place, a real job, reducing our dependence on fossil fuels by having a plan to you know, make sure that our schools, our public hospitals, our public places, our private homes, you know, that, that we introduce uh, energy conservation measures. I think that's very practical. I think we could fund it if, if we put our heads to it. And I think the ultimate uh, ambition is to keep, you know, to keep our climate change, uh, you know, to, to reduce that 2% if we can, or hold it, at that, and that will affect future tragedies and climate change catastrophes we're all going to face. And if we step up, step up to that in Europe, and if we can deal in doing that with our unemployment problem, particularly youth unemployment, I think that's what I would like to see happen. And I know it's not necessarily your agenda today, but it's my agenda. I think everybody here, I don't know if anybody disagrees with me. I don't need three as I hope. No. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, we do have the rapporteur from the Environment Committee here. So, Ms. Gardini, what, what do you make of that, the plan for the youth, tackling youth unemployment through greening the economy? Beh, questo è un tema, è uno dei temi eh, importanti che, che percorrono sempre il Parlamento, la Commissione e credo che se cominciassimo eh, ognuno nei propri paesi 
a uh, dare un indirizzo pratico e concreto alle linee some, uh, eh, guida e ai consigli, eh, le cose um, che vengono date dall'Europa. E, le, e le, eh, parlo per esempio per, per il mio paese che tante Talking volte country, eh, magari pensa di, eh, di subire no, delle regole, questa è un po' la percezione che hanno i cittadini, ma io credo che sia proprio a volte eh, come dire, una, una carenza rules, dei governi nazionali di, ehm, di, 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 di dare concretezza e di accompagnare propositivamente con delle politiche attive, propositive, progettuali, quelle che sono delle linee guida che partono da Bruxelles e che sono vogliono essere assolutamente propulsive e non repressive. Noi vogliamo creare crescita, sviluppo, posti di lavoro, non certo recessioni o austerity fine a se stessa. Questo è uno dei grandi temi, dei grandissimi temi. E sicuramente quando noi parliamo di protezione civile, Partendo dalla protezione civile, partendo dallo sguardo che si ha sul cambiamento climatico e sull'evoluzione, noi abbiamo un punto di vista attraverso dal quale si può partire veramente ampliando lo sguardo e vedere complessivamente la nostra società e la nostra economia. Detto questo, per concludere anche per quello che è il mio, la mia parte, io vorrei dire che io sono assolutamente positiva e ottimista rispetto al lavoro che dovrà essere concluso. Mi auguro a breve, brevissimo in consiglio. Eh, io credo che probabilmente abbia, non abbia favorito eh, la chiusura eh, in tempi brevissimi il fatto che questi negoziati andavano avanti in parallelo con i negoziati sul quadro finanziario pluriennale. Sappiamo che quando si va così in parallelo a questi grandi negoziati eh, c'è sempre un po' di sofferenza. Ma eh, io credo che se noi guardiamo la nostra storia noi vediamo che nessun paese in Europa è mai stato lasciato solo nel momento del bisogno, è sempre nata. E proprio partendo dai paesi più lontani del nord una gara di solidarietà alla quale nessuno si è sottratto e quindi io voglio credere in questa nostra esperienza e voglio pensare che nessuno voglia aspettare che ci sia un'altra vittima per essere pronti ad andare a soccorrere quella vittima ecco, ehm, noi sappiamo che la rapidità della risposta è quella che soprattutto serve a salvare vite umane e quindi io non posso assolutamente credere che per piccoli eh, veramente piccolissimi eh, problemi di, 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 di budget che sono veramente irrisori come ha ricordato la commissaria ci possa essere qualcuno che pensa che potremmo essere un pochino meno preparati di quanto noi potremmo essere. Centinaia di miliardi di eh, danni abbiamo affrontati negli ultimi decenni, ma Because pensiamo anche alle vite umane che noi potremmo salvare. In questo senso, riducendomi a quanto ha detto l'amico veterano spagnolo, questa legislazione è e sarà non solo una bandiera per i terzi paesi, ma una bandiera all'interno dell'Europa, per i nostri cittadini, ricordate tutti i paesi, che, tutti i governi, che il più del 90% degli europei chiedono più Europa, in quanti altri settori chiedono più Europa. Allora una grande bandiera con un piccolo sforzo per avere un'Europa più vicina ai cittadini. Thank you very much. Uh, Madame Strifler, very briefly from you, and then Mr. Muller, final thought on what you've heard. Thank you. Madame Strifler. Ah, okay. Oui, c'était juste deux secondes. Je crois qu'il faut aussi que nous trouvions des réponses cohérentes. Moi, je suis d'accord avec tout ce qui a été dit, bien sûr, sur tout ce qui est réchauffement climatique, sur toutes les mesures que nous devons tous prendre. Nous sommes nous tous d'accord là-dessus. Mais soyons également réalistes. Je veux dire, à partir du moment où nous savons très bien que nous devons encourager la petite agriculture, que ce soit dans les pays en voie de développement ou même dans les pays européens, nous ne pouvons pas en même temps accepter la déforestation et encourager nos grands groupes financiers à, à, à contribuer à cette déforestation. Donc je crois qu'à un moment donné, je suis désolée de toujours être terre à terre, mais je crois qu'il faut être cohérent. Nous avons tous de grands principes, nous avons tous, de grands de, euh, nous avons tous envie de changer les choses, nous avons tous envie de lutter contre le réchauffement climatique, mais qu'est-ce que nous, nous faisons Est-ce que nous attaquons les grands groupes Est-ce que, est que nous sommes vraiment cohérents avec ce que nous voulons Donc moi j'attends aussi de la part des politiques, j'en suis une de c'est bien, mais plus de courage politique. Parce que entre ce que nous voulons, entre ce que nous désirons et entre ce que nous faisons, il y a souvent un grand fossé. Et moi, j'aimerais euh, bien que le Parlement européen, tout parti politique confondu, toute commission euh, confondue, soit un petit peu plus courageuse. Et je vous garantis que nous ga gagnerons beaucoup de temps aussi. Donc, euh, avis euh, à bon entendeur.
Thank you. Slight deviation from civil protection there, but thank you very much. A uh, final thought from you, Mr. Muller, before we break for coffee. Yeah, very briefly. <clears throat> First of all, most of the things have already been said by the, those who spoke before me, and, uh, and I couldn't agree more with what was said, kind of looking at the principles and more efficient and speedy. I mean, in general, I think, uh, I mean, we, we, we need to use the resources more efficiently, but what I could see still is definitely a deepening in our relationship, the exchange of information. I see what I saw this morning, actually, when we opened the ERC. Of course, you have many more resources than we have, actually, and, and making them available to us would greatly also enhance our capability to respond. But beyond that, actually, there's another point. We spoke so much about resilience and capacity building and, and, and preparedness. Actually, Europe is really unique. You have an enormous wealth of experience, enormous uh, wealth of resources, which actually should be made available, not only available, but the knowledge should be made available also to other parts of the world. And I think here Europe could really start helping others without necessarily translating a European system into another part of the world. It will not be accepted. But using the experience you have and spread it. And I think here is an enormous uh, element which you could reach out and help actually others building their resilience, sharing your experience. I want to stop here. I think this, I just wanted to put this thought into the room. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Can I just, uh, uh, can I just uh, because the minister made the point and uh, others had the chance to, to respond to it, I, for one, in, in, am in favor of fighting unemployment and improving the livability of Europe and the rest of the world. So, uh, uh, and I would be interested to see how many of you are in favor of that, of, of the proposal that we can fight unemployment by, by getting young people engaged in activities that improve our resilience. How many of you are in favor of that? Okay, well... Good way to end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, we're going to break for coffee very shortly, but just a quick recap. A lot of discussion about prevention and preparedness, more need for coordinated action from the European member states, whilst understanding that the member states maintain their own sovereignty, plans for greening the European economy and improving youth unemployment through resilience projects, more better integrated academic networks, and, of course, the new crisis response centre as well. Thank you all very much. We're going to break for coffee, and then the sessions will continue afterwards.